can everyone hear me? I think it's fine. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Remy Nicole. You might have seen it on the slide. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about that. Uh, this is the first time for me uh, talking uh, in front of a large audience, so please bear with me. Uh, I'm working uh, at the CEA, uh, or CEA in French, and, uh, and here we do, among other things, uh, fundamental physics research. And uh, one of the projects I, uh, I had was to uh, create a NixOS image that, uh, that's going to be run on a small part of the accelerator. And, uh, and I wanted to share my experience with you, uh, some things that went well, some things that went uh, less well. And hopefully uh, with this talk, you're going to learn a bit about uh, cross-compilation, how to do it in Nix, how to cross-compile NixOS images, and uh, how to debug some things, uh, some things with Nix. Uh, but first, uh, what is cross-compilation? Because if you do not work on embedded systems or if you haven't done some uh, DIY stuff, well, maybe you haven't had a use case for it. So it's nice to have a, a reflection. And uh, the reason we have cross-compilation is that, well, people can seem to agree on stuff. And so uh, we have uh, different, uh, well, different types of, uh, of workloads. Maybe you want to optimize for performance. Maybe you want to optimize for power efficiency. Maybe you want to, to optimize for freedom. And uh, these are uh, all the kind of trade-offs that you have when you are designing a CPU or when you are designing an operating system. And so, uh, for example, here we have two uh, your common cases. On the left, you have the Raspberry Pi, which is uh, whose CPU is ARM 64-bit, and who is going to be running Linux. And on the on the left, uh, you uh, on the right, sorry, it's opposite. On the on the right, you have a macOS, which is uh, well, we say it's a Darwin operating uh, system, and it's uh, it's a, it's an older one, so it's going to be uh, x86 uh, 64. And both of these architectures are uh, considered T2 uh, in Nix packages, so they are well, uh, well uh, supported. And so uh, we can define cross-compilation as uh, well, compiling a package from a given system, which is the CPU architecture and the operating system, among other things, and from a system to a given other uh, system. And we might do that uh, due to performance issue. For example, we have a Raspberry Pi who uh, doesn't have the same amount of computation power, the same amount of memory as my development laptop, who is uh, x86-64 Linux. And uh, we might also do that due to availability issue. Well, we, we might want to compile for uh, Windows, and I don't have a Windows on hand, so, may, so uh, it's, it's nice to be able to cross-compile for, for other systems. And uh, why is it special? Well, uh, build systems can be a bit complicated, and you have, uh, most of the time, you have two different kinds of dependencies. You have dependencies that you need to run while it's doing the build, and you have dependencies which are going to uh, be run uh, well, while, while you are running the software. For example, you have GCC make who, who needs to be run uh, while you are building the software, but uh, for every other normal runtime dependencies like libraries or other programs that is going to be run at runtime, well, it, it, it needs to be run on the end machine. And so how do you do that in Nix? Uh, how do we define that in Nix? Uh, because uh, in Nix, we, we have some uh, terminology which comes from the Autotools project, which is kind of a de facto standard. You might see some differences in other projects, but this is, I think, the most common one. And we have three types of platform. We have the build platform, which is the platform where you are building the software. And you have the uh, host platform, which is, which is a platform running the software, the end platform, how, how I called it earlier. And we have also a special case, the target platform for software that generates code. Well, it's the, it's the platform for which we want to generate code. For example, if we have the GCC, the C compiler, uh, that can be built on my development uh, laptop, x86-64 Linux, that is going to run on a Raspberry Pi, but generates code for another third system. And that third system is going to be the target platform. And, uh, um, so there is two very good talk uh, on the web. There is one uh, introduction into cross-compiling with Nix packages uh, by uh, Jörg uh, Teilheim. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. And a another great talk at uh, Euro LLVM uh, uh, by John Erickson, who presented uh, the Nix way of things to the LLVM uh, packaging people. And uh, most of the graphics that I'm going to be showing you are uh, adaptation of that, uh, of that talk. And here we have an example of uh, me trying to cross-compile HDOP with two of its dependencies. 
And we have the normal runtime dependency and curses, which is a library which uh, displays uh, characters on the screen. And it needs to be run on the same platform as, uh, as the platform we are using uh, HTML. Uh, and so here we have, uh, well, let me get the uh, magnifying glass. So, so here we have uh, the platform which is going to be running the software. And so the end curses is going to be run on the same platform as HTML. And this is not the case for GCC. GCC needs to be run on the build machine, which is x86-64 Linux. And so uh, GCC is going to be built on x86 Linux, but it is also going to run on uh, x86 Linux, but will generate code for the Raspberry Pi. And if you have uh, done some packaging uh, with, uh, with Nix and Nix packages, you may have seen already those, uh, those two attributes, which are uh, build inputs and native build inputs. Uh, which uh, allows you to specify which kind of dependency uh, you, uh, you are specifying. And so if we take the, uh, the graphics again, so this is build inputs, uh, which uh, is kind of like saying, uh, if you put a dependency in build inputs, you are going to be saying, well, the, the host platform, the build platform, and the target platform are going to be the same as the software, uh, of, uh, as the, the end software. But for native build inputs, uh, well, uh, we're kind of shifting, uh, uh, shifting to the left and saying that uh, it needs to run on, uh, on the build platform that generates code on the, uh, on the host platform of the software. And we have also some, uh, some special case which we, you might encounter that's like shifting one more. If you need a compiler that generates code for the build machine, for example, if while you are building the software, you need to generate tools for building the software. This is, this is kind of a special case. And you have also some very, very special cases like uh, Debs build target and Debs target target, which are used only in one place uh, while compiling GCC and uh, figuring, figuring out why you need this is left on an exercise uh, uh, to, to the reader. And uh, how do you actually compile stuff? Well, uh, you have the uh, very handy packages cross uh, uh, attribute uh, inside Nix packages, which defines, uh, uh, which contains a lot of different uh, platforms that are predefined for you. And here we have the Raspberry Pi one. And uh, from this, we can uh, get the hello packages. And if we, if we evaluate and build that, well, you will, you will cross-compile the hello packages and all of its dependencies uh, from your uh, platform for the Raspberry Pi. And if you copy uh, this package and all of its dependencies to the Raspberry Pi, all of its closure, well, you will get a running uh, a hello world. And if you want to know uh, all of the systems that were pre-configured uh, pre for you, you can look at the lib.systems.examples. And if, you, if your system is not already pre-configured, you, you can have uh, kind of like an expert mode uh, in which you can specify uh, everything, uh, everything uh, that defines your system. So you, you can specify the CPU architecture and the OS, and you can specify how, how you want to configure your Linux kernel and maybe some GCC options uh, if you want to go uh, into, uh, into some details. This is kind of a spoiler for the next part of the talk. And, uh, and yeah, and now this was for singular package, uh, packages. So what do, you want, well, what do you do when you want to cross compile a whole NixOS image? Well, in your NixOS configuration, you can use the nixpackages.cross system uh, um, option. And you can in here uh, pass a, a pre-configured system or the expert mode uh, system. And maybe if you want to compile some packages that uh, aren't supported in your very special system, you can also use the allow and supported system uh, option. And if you're interested, and uh, from this, you can use uh, some attributes from the uh, config.system.build uh, output option. And uh, you can uh, compile, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the file system, the kernel, the initramfs, and SD card image. And if you're interested, there is a talk, I think, tomorrow uh, called uh, NixOS Can Live uh, Anywhere from uh, Linus Ackerman, who, who are going to talk about that uh, into more detail. So uh, how hard can it be uh, in, in my use case? But yeah, uh, spoiler, it was uh, a bit funky. 
And uh, here's the context in terms of, of the project. So we have some acquisition boards, which, is going, which are going to be uh, acquiring data about the electromagnetic field uh, generated by a beam. And uh, this data is going to be displayed on a view that is going to be shown on operator to check if the beam is in a good shape. And here we have the, uh, the small setup that we have uh, on our lab. So here the ring that we have is going, uh, is going to uh, accept the beam inside it. And we have a small cable inside it to uh, simulate uh, the electromagnetic field. And this goes into an uh, electronic front end because of uh, you know, electricity stuff, I, not my job. And, we, uh, and this uh, goes into a uh, acquisition card on the uh, top left. And the acquisition card is going to do some acquisitions and, uh, and transmit data over the network to the view that is uh, on the right. But what, in, what about in terms of hardware? Well, we have a board that is called IFC 1410 from a manufacturer called IOXOS. The architecture is a Power PC 64, a big engine, so the, the old one, if you're familiar with it. And it doesn't have any storage. Uh, I'm not going to talk about into details about uh, how we how we uh, went around the no storage thing, but you can talk to me afterwards if you're interested. Uh, here we go. Uh, in terms of software, the acquisition uh, software is already packaged using Nix. Uh, but before we were using uh, Yocto to build an image and, uh, and basically in, in the company we had a very old image that nobody knew how to reproduce and uh, it was kind of, uh, kind of hard to, uh, to pick up the project backup and so uh, we decided to try, uh, to try NixOS to, uh, to rebuild a whole new image with the acquisition software on it. And, uh, so what we did at first was uh, try and uh, and uh, do a very minimal NixOS image. So this is very uh, so this is a very uh, minimal set of options. We we import the minimal profile, which removes some dependencies, and we configure our cross system like I showed earlier, and uh, we, uh, uh, we 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 said that we were uh, going to use uh, to use the latest stable version of NixOS because you know production and. Uh, Stable versions that uh, that's, uh, that's uh, that goes well in hand in hand, and so let's try to compile that. Oh God. there's there's a lot of thing going on. Oh, oh, I'm trying to compile the Rust compiler. So on a side note, if you are trying to cross compile a whole NixOS system, be prepared to have a lot of computing power and a lot of time because there's a lot of packages to uh, to compile. And I mean, I love Rust and all, but uh, I, this feels kind of weird to have a Rust uh, code in a very minimal image. So uh, I don't know what is uh, going on uh, in there. But uh, first, let's try to, uh, to to figure out what exactly is not uh, it's not going well. So here we are trying to build our image, and I'm going to add the keep going option to try and list every uh, uh, every packages that uh, is not compiled. And this is the this is the list that we have. We have the Nedal uh, project, we have uh, which is a cryptography library, which is pretty used uh, uh, everywhere. And we have the Kexec tools, which uh, which are tools to uh, for the Kexec kernel feature, which allows the kernel to replace itself while it's running. It's not really necessary, but it, it, if we can have it, well, it's nice to have. We have Linux, the kernel, which uh, is pretty annoying if you don't have uh, for running an XOS image. And we have the Rust C compiler, which uh, doesn't compile. I mean, <laughs> I, you, you know, I love Rust, but uh, uh, if the Rust uh, compiler doesn't compile, it sounds like a, it sounds like a U problem, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to keep Rust if I can. So let's try to find uh, to find out uh, what exactly is going wrong. And uh, here we have the output of the uh, Nettle build, and we have a very weird uh, message that saying that the ABI version one is not compatible with. Uh, ABI version 2. I don't have uh, anything. Uh, uh, I haven't specified anything about ABI, so it, that's pretty weird. And the Rust C uh, compiler has a similar output. And uh, for KXEC, uh, there is also a very weird uh, message saying that a, a common lag flag is incompatible with the flag NABI LP2. So already you can see a very uh, common theme that there is something going on between two ABIs, version 1, version 2. We are going to look uh, to, to look at that a bit later. 
And for the kernel, uh, kind of important, we have some uh, even weirder uh, outputs saying that uh, there is a uh, assembly uh, assembly code that is not recognizable. Um, I was pretty surprised to see that. So first, let's talk, let's talk about ABI. So what is an ABI? So ABI is kind of the binary land API. So uh, it means uh, application binary interface, and it's, it, it kind of defines the, the calling convention, for example, in assembly, if you want to call a function and the function has arguments, maybe you want to pass the arguments inside a register, which register, or you want to pass arguments from memory, how do you order the memory, uh, how, how structures are stored in memory, well, this is what the ABI defines. And uh, we have, um, for, for some context, the uh, small history of the PowerPC uh, architecture. So it was created in 1991, so it's older than me. And uh, the ELF v1 uh, ABI was created uh, shortly after and was kind of the default ABI uh, for, this, uh, for this architecture, 64-bit uh, version after. And in 2014, uh, they, 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 they kind of figured out that uh, we needed a little Indian uh, version of it. And uh, it was also a good time to create a new ABI a version 2 ELF v2. And uh, they, they kind of designed it, uh, this ABI in a way that was backwards compatible. So you can still use PowerPC 64 Big Indian with the new ABI. And uh, the new ABI just does a lot of things better because the old one was well, in 1995 where the, the uh, development practices were quite, uh, quite a bit different. And if you are a bit interested, there is a great talk that helped me a lot uh, on the also LLVM, uh, also an NLV, LLVM conference uh, from uh, Dr. Ulrich uh, Weigand. And so, what does this imply for us? Well, uh, GCC defaults to the ELF, sorry, ELF v1 uh, for poor PC64 Big Indian, and it defaults to the ELF v2 version uh, for the Little Indian uh, variant. And some projects assume that Big Indian implies LV1. So because GCC defaults to, to, to it, it means that you're going to be using it. And some other projects uh, requires LV2 to work no matter if you are uh, Little Indian or Big Indian. And so if you choose LV1, some projects won't work. And uh, among them is the Muzzle project, which is kind of important to, to, compile, uh, to compile statically uh, well, uh, anything, so it's, it, it's a dependency for, for Nix, so uh, kind of important. And uh, if you're going to be choosing ELF v2, uh, well, uh, some project won't compile because it makes a wrong assumption and will pass some wrong flags or some uh, wrong assembly. And NixOS tries to do the same thing and, uh, and defaults to the ELF v2 ABI because, well, it's the new one and uh, it's, it's the better one. And so we have those three projects, uh, Nettle, uh, KXX tools, and Rusty, which makes the wrong assumption that LV1 is going to be used. And Linux, well, it's, <laughs> Linux is a bit weirder, so let's talk about that later. And some other Linux distribution to the rescue. Thank you to uh, Ryan Burns for pushing me into the right direction. And some of the uh, distributions like Void Linux and FreeBSD are trying to push for LV2 for the PowerPC architecture. And so you can, and so you can join the, these patches uh, and apply them to these packages and, uh, we are, and we're basically good to go. And so with this, Nettle and KXEC tools uh, were fixed. Not Rust C, so we are still going to be looking into removing it. And so how do you do this? So first, Thing is we want to figure out where exactly the Rust C dependency comes from. And so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to use this uh, little handy command, so nixpath info, uh, derivation to, uh, to specify that I want the build time dependencies, recursive, because when I want the transitive dependency, and I'm going to filter and, uh, well, and see what, ex uh, what exactly I'm depending uh, for the Rust C compiler. And, Little bit of a weird thing, we depend on two different versions of Rust C. So uh, let's, let's try to figure out, uh, well, the first one. And so the first one, another very handy uh, Nix command. So I'm going to ask Nix, why do I depend on this version of Rust C? And Nix is going to be very nice and tells us that 
Uh, my package is an X-ray system, and I depend on Polkit, which is a daemon that uh, authorizes uh, some uh, users to, to do uh, privileged stuff. And the rules are written in JavaScript, because God knows why. And, uh, <laughs> and so this needs a JavaScript engine, and, which is SpiderMonkey. And the SpiderMonkey depends on a Rust project. So here is Rust C bindgen. And this is kind of weird because from the manual, it seems Polkit is disabled by default. So it's kind of weird that in my minimal image, well, uh, I have the Polkit dependency. So I'm going to figure out why uh, Polkit is enabled. And Polkit is enabled uh, through the security.polkit.enable option. And so I'm going to ask from my options, security.polkit.enabled, uh, uh, which files uh, modify that option. And it's going to tell me that well, the UDISK2 file is going to, uh, uh, to, to pull Polkit, and UDISK2 is enabled by default. So from the manual, it says that uh, the uh, Polkit is disabled by default, but in effect, UDISK2 is enabled and will pull Polkit, so in effect, it's going to be enabled. Uh, this was fixed in uh, NixOS 22.11. Sure, uh, I don't have anything to do with that change, but thank you. And so uh, we can just set this to enable equals false, and then we remove this dependency. And we can do the same thing uh, for the other Rusty, and it tells me that, well, we have a, sh a shutdown RAMFS, which we don't need. I'm not going into, in, in, into details on uh, what it does, but it's written in Rusty, and it's, uh, it's implemented into, uh, in Nixpackages, packages, I think. And so we can just uh, look at the documentation and, uh, and uh, disable, disable that. And with this, uh, we have uh, yeeted the, the Rust C compiler out of, uh, out of this world. So now to, uh, to Linux. And this took a lot of time and a lot of debugging to figure out. And this was also very unnerving because the Linux kernel had no issues building uh, when, uh, when building it through Yocto with the same version of GCC. And my mind could not even fathom that Yocto was in any, shape, any way, shape, or form superior to, uh, to, to Nix. And so I was kind of uh, pulling my hair out and uh, trying to figure out why, uh, why the Linux kernel was, uh, was not building. And I'm not going into details of what I did uh, to, uh, to, to debug it. Maybe, some, maybe I did some black magic. I don't know. And well, the culprit was the binutils project, kind of, not really. So for, for some, com some context, the binutils project contains the uh, assembler, which transforms the assembly code from the text format into the binary format. And sometimes GCC passes the wrong machine to the assembler because, you know, bugs. And uh, the assembler fails because it's, uh, well, it received the wrong machine from, the, from its arguments and uh, the assembly codes were written for the right machine and so it gets confused and, 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 and thinks that uh, some, uh, some instructions are just wrong. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the weird thing is that, uh, well, the unnerving thing was that it was, it was fixed uh, upstream and Yocto was using a development, a, a commit on a development branch of Binutils, and so it, it didn't have the issue. Uh, okay, and with this, well, everything is working. So here you have a picture of my thumb and the hand attached to it and every transitive dependencies, which is nice. But what's interesting is that uh, we have the uh, view that is going to be shown on uh, the operator uh, uh, view and everything's working and I'm pretty happy and uh, I can sleep at night. Uh, so, uh, how, uh, what does this mean in practice? You know, uh, uh, this code is going to be stored on the uh, company GitLab and I need other people to be interested in Nix, so I need uh, everything to look nice and be presentable. So how, how does this look in practice? Well, in practice, in my project, uh, I have an overlay uh, in which uh, I can say that uh, for example, the k-exec tools uh, that is going to be using in my system packages is the previous k-exec tools, but I'm going to override its, its attributes and modify the patches attributes, and I'm going to fetch the old patches that were uh, pre-applied or the empty list uh, if, if there's no patches. And uh, the patch that I'm going to be adding is uh, a patch fetched from the void Linux project. 
And I think it's pretty readable. I think it's pretty understandable what I'm doing here. And of course, I'm going to be adding a little comment explaining the situation. Project.nix file that blatantly tells you that, well, things are not perfect, but here's exactly what's quirky. And I quite like having that file because it, it, makes, it makes everything clear about what we, are, uh, what we need to do uh, you know, upstream to fix, uh, to fix, uh, fix things. So, in conclusion, well, uh, on the on the overall, I think it works pretty well. Uh, it's uh, it's reproducible, it's configurable, yada yada. You you know you know already the stuff, and uh, the the reproducibility of Nix really, it really isn't a myth because you know the screenshot of the errors that I showed you are very recent. I just uh, I just uh, went back in time to an old commit and just commented out the workarounds and I could get exactly the errors that I did, uh, that I had uh, when, uh, uh, when I, uh, I, did, uh, I did the project. Uh, the code is clear, I think. I mean, I, I'm obviously biased, but uh, this is what I think. And most issues arose from uh, the fact that uh, the PowerPC64 uh, architecture uh, big engine variant is quite old and, and sometimes misunderstood for poor architecture. And uh, the, also the very weird GCC Benetulus issue, which is also for a PC64 uh, specific. Um, and uh, thing, things that were a bit, a bit more hard, that I, I, didn't, I, I don't have the time to talk about it, but uh, um, I, I needed to add a custom kernel, and uh, well, it's not very documented on how to do that. I need also needed to add a custom kernel configuration, custom uh, device tree, and, and this is thing that I think uh, could be a bit simpler and, and more documented. Uh, the board uh, also has the U-boot uh, bootloader uh, platform firmware, and uh, there were some bugs uh, when you combine this with the uh, netboot uh, output of, the, of, uh, of NixOS. And also needed to remove some needed file systems and grub because you know I don't need grub. I'm booting from the uh, I'm booting from from new boot and from the network. Small comparison here. Uh, so you have Yocto and Buildroot, which are which are two projects uh, that are pretty known in the in the embedded systems community, which uh, compiles a whole Linux images for embedded systems. And basically, I think the the one thing that we could improve in Nix. Well, we have an awesome community. We have a uh, um, two matrix channels. We have the cross compilation matrix channel and the exotic platform uh, matrix channel. But we, I mean, uh, compared to the Yocto and Buildroot projects, whose uh, entire community is uh, is uh, is centered around the embedded system field, I think we need more. Uh, I think we need more uh, human resources. And we need more human resources to do more testing, more experiments, more infrastructure, and more uh, systems that are uh, upgraded in, into the tier list. And, uh, uh, and for the network group, well, you come see me afterward. I don't have to type. <laughs> Here's the bibliography. Uh, thank you very much. We have time for two questions. I will head over there first because I saw that hand first. Uh, hi, uh, I have a small question. Um, at one point you said that NixOS defaults to uh, Big Endian but with LV2, right? Uh, uh, sorry, can, can you speak a bit? Uh, yeah. So at one point you said that NixOS defaults to Big Endian for PowerPC, yeah. but with LV2. Yeah. But isn't Big Endian the LV1, like the original architecture? So why does NixOS kind of default to a mix of the two instead of? I, I'm sorry, I, I cannot understand. There's a lot of, of echo. So. Um, I'll, I'll repeat one last time. Uh, so at one point you said that uh, NixOS defaults yeah. to Big Endian code for PowerPC, uh, uh, but LV2, and, uh, near the middle of the talk um, okay. earlier. So let me just go back to this uh, slide here. Um, this one. So here... Um, no, I think it's a bit earlier. You, you, it was near the bottom of the slide. Uh, a, few, a few slides earlier. Earlier, uh, earlier was, the, uh, was the, uh, the theory. 
Uh, uh, that? It seems like a mixture of the two, right? It's that it's a big Indian, but it's LP2. Yeah. Why does NixOS default to that? Uh, because, uh, well, that, that was uh, Ryan Burns that, uh, that made this change, and he made this change because some projects really require LV2 for both big engine and little engine, and this I is see. a hard requirement. For LV1, uh, this, uh, the projects that don't work with it is because of the wrong assumption uh, of, of, uh, of the thing. So it was kind of the more uh, normal assumption to, to right, okay. decision. Thank you. So I saw a few hands, and if you want to fight for it with like rock, paper, scissors, I'm, I'm all in for that. Guillaume is giving away his place. Yeah, so first I'd like to say it's uh, interesting to see you uh, run into the issue with uh, bin utils. Um, I'd say maybe it's one of the hardest packages in mixed packages to update. I uh, can recall uh, one version of bin utils had been reverted like three times <laughs> on staging. Uh, very hard, uh, that package to work with. I had a question about the how robust, how st stable it was for you to work with NixOS cross compilation over time. Uh, if we're looking at master, then quite often there are regressions uh, because of mistakes in the dependency specification. How was this for you on, on, on stable? Because I think you are using 0.5, right? Yeah. 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 So I was. Uh, so I am using uh, stable, and um, I do some updates uh, from time to time to try to compile it. And I don't have many many issues with it. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know uh, what to say more about okay. this. But that's what I want to say. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. 